this was probably uh, the part of my studies where I felt like things clicked the most. Um, hmm. And uh, I was just, I, I, I finally sort of understood, you know, how to observe more more clearly and just be very ruthless about uh, how, how to fit things, how to fit things together. Today we have a very special guest, a great artist that you're going to want to meet, someone who is going to teach you things that you never thought you'd ever learn. Welcome to Josh LaRock. Hi, Josh. Hey, Eric. Hey, good to be here. Nice to have you here. It's an honor. You're such a brilliant artist, and uh, I'm anxious to hear what you have to talk about today. you have any idea what you're going to do? Well, thanks. Yeah, well, I mean, you've, you've kind of caught me here in a time, actually, where I'm packing up my house and I'm in the middle of a move. Um, but uh, so that meant that, you know, it's an opportune time to go through all my, my you know, old uh, paintings and drawings, even student work. So I had those out and I thought it'd be fun to kind of share that with you guys and, and maybe kind of talk about some of the things that, you know, the way that I learned and how, how you know, how I went through that progression and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully give you guys some, some interesting, you know, principles to, to think about and, and, uh, and bring into your own work. Well, I, I really appreciate you not only taking time on a Sunday, but also taking time in the middle of a move. That's that's a tough time. So that's this is a Herculean effort. So thank you, Josh. <laughs> yeah, I'm anxious to hear about the learning process because uh, you developed <clears throat> such high quality at such a young age. And uh, so I think we'd all like to learn how you learned and then, you know, maybe what you would have changed in the process. So you're moving, and and you've been living in Austin, Texas, and you're moving to where? We're we're going to uh, Portland, Maine. Oh, wow! So uh, that's where my wife is from, and um, we, you know, before we moved to Austin, we had we had kind of always had it in our head that it was either Austin, uh, where my family's in the Houston area still, uh, or you know, going up to Maine uh, to be with her family, and. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a tough decision. Anytime you're kind of pulled in two different directions, and we were here for a little over a year, and uh, our plan was to go up there for the summers and you know spend a couple months there while the kids weren't in school, and um, and I guess you know we, we got a little extended time due to COVID. My daughter's school didn't you know start on time or was going virtual, and so we just you know it's just enough to kind of rethink the decision and uh, and decide that that was a better fit at this moment. So um, we're excited. It's, you know, we're ready to get through kind of the logistical side of it, but. Well, uh, I would think all the artists who live in Portland, Portland, Maine are about to get a, a great teacher. Are you going to do some <laughs> teaching up there or some, some uh, live teaching? You know, I don't know, actually. Um, that's yet to be determined. I mean, that, there's so much to offer uh, in Maine. I mean, it's, it's been a place that's drawn artists for, you know, centuries. And, um, but yeah, I'm not really exactly sure what the venues are, are are like up there and and I think part of what kind of factored into the decision to make this move is so much of what I do and what we all do now is just non-local you know there, it involves so much travel and you know teaching uh, teaching remotely teaching online which I've moved to be doing as well um, so yeah so I don't I don't actually know what I'm gonna be doing uh, in the area uh, but um, we're looking forward to it and, I'll, and we'll be back I mean we plan to be splitting splitting our time um, here as well you know it's a one of the blessings but also the kind of curse of being an artist is you don't need to be anywhere but you know uh, sometimes that that there's decision fatigue that gets involved there if you know what I mean well I know you're doing it you do a lot of portrait commissions around the world right. I know you do you're doing some zoom teaching there's a lot of yeah. different opportunities for people so right. I'm gonna let you go ahead and and kind of start your discussion about what you were doing today and or what sure. you, you wanted to talk about today but I, I do think if you would weave into this, um, uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know about the atelier system that was kind of created back in the in Jerome's days, or maybe before right. that, the, the training system and um, how someone might get themselves trained to get the level of quality that someone like yourself is 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 getting. What would that process be like? Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, sure. Uh, well, so I'll just jump in. I mean, there's there's different ways that the you know people put together a curriculum and atelier movement. And atelier is just essentially the French word for the studio or workshop. Um, it's you know in 19th century France, the, the students would go and they would actually be in the studio of their master artist, 
um, and then they would be uh, painting and drawing either along with them or with a group of students that the you know that the artist was uh, you know master over or in charge of uh, in charge of uh, instructing. Um, but the way that I learned, I, I moved to New York City um, in 2006, and I uh, was in my early 20s, and I had already gone to college, um, and I had really kind of just sort of found out about this movement and uh, found out about Jacob Collins, who was the uh, you know the instructor, the principal instructor, the founder of what was then uh, Water, the Water Street Atelier, which has now kind of grown and become the Grand Central Academy. Um, but the thing that I loved about that program and what I kind of want to show you some examples of is it was very uh, logical and step by step so that, you know, you're you're adding one level of, of difficulty at a time um, rather than just sort of jumping in and trying to sort of juggle all the variables that are inherent to, uh, you know, painting from life, painting a figure, use, you know, using oil paints. Um, and all these things. So we started primarily with with drawing. And actually, what I've got here, this is this is one of my very first uh, portrait sketches. Um, I think from you know, probably the first week or so that I was at I was at Jacobs. Now, I mean, this is probably not you know the first portrait I'd ever done. I'd, I'd done some classes kind of ad hoc, you know, in in high school and college, but nothing with um, you know sort of formal uh, technical skill that was. Uh, that was put into it, and um, and this is certainly one of the first times I had painted from or drawn from life. You know, so we had a model. Um, it, you know, he had controlled the lighting in his studio really well, and that's actually something I'm going to try to weave through all of these that I'm going to show you is the um, how to how to spend time on uh, setting up your 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 uh, figure, your figure, your portrait, your still life, whatever it may be. Um, you know, because as I said, I, I do a fair amount of, uh, of teaching, whether it's workshops or um, now that I'm teaching, doing some teaching online, some online mentoring, <clears throat> we end up using uh, reference photographs, reference images uh, to draw and paint from. And that's fine. I mean, I'm definitely an advocate for working from life whenever possible, but, you know, I know as well uh, as anybody that logistically that can be tough. Uh, you know, getting a model, especially in COVID times, you know, can you even, can you be socially distanced and, and, and actually work from a live model? Uh, but what tends to happen when people are using photo reference is they're, they're not used to setting up the lighting. They're, you know, they're usually sort of just taking images, uh, you know, in whatever lighting scenario, usually like friends or family and things like that. And it, so they, they tend to be like backlit. Uh, there tends to be, you know, many light sources because, you know, in our general lives, there we, we live in a place, you know, there's ambient light, there's reflected light, all these different kinds of things, and that's okay to paint from. It's just it, it makes the variables of how of how to understand values that much more uh, difficult, right? So what we did back to back to the training is we controlled it so we had a very single light source, an artificial light source. Uh, so that it wasn't variable, right? Like natural light would be. And uh, blocking out most of the ambient light in the room so that we had really very clear, very clear shadow shapes. Um, and uh, that, that helps from you know, a, number, a number of levels. But, but anyway, so this is the, this is the first, um, one of the first sketches that I did. Um, you know, it's all right. Can you see this, Eric? Is yeah. All right? Yeah. Uh, Hopefully that there's not too much glare to it. You know, there's there's uh, the mouth is kind of frontalized, meaning that like I've he's in profile, but the mouth is looking more at us uh, perpendicularly than the rest of his face. The eyes are too high, but what you can see here is just this this sense of you know the graphic light and dark. And so I could come in here and I could pick out this little cheek form. And and the goal, what I later learned, the goal is to Kind of forget that you're drawing a cheek forget that you're drawing a person at least initially right and observe it purely observe the shape purely even if you can abstract that shape into like i don't know i'm having this happening happening to see like a bird's beak or something like that then you you see through your idea of what you think uh you know eyes an eye and a nose and a mouth looks like um, and oftentimes, you know, a cheek is a cheek is an area of the face that's completely disregarded. We sort of, you know, we focus on the features, and then somehow, you know, the cheek and the chin uh, end up getting there uh, in the first place. But uh, but anyway, so I didn't, I, you know, I was just 
trying to sort of wing it and figure out what I was doing. Um, you know, I can see, you can see some little doodles over here in the corner, hopefully of uh, Jacob trying to describe any sort of structure and, and, uh, and, and volume. Um, but those, you know, these are, these are ideas that take, that take time and a lot of practice. So I'm curious. So, yeah. About, yeah. I'm curious about one thing, and that is that yeah. um, uh, some some of the ateliers will start people off with Barg. We were yeah. Barg drawings. There's a Barg book that Braden Parrish was talking about the other day, mm -hmm. uh, and then they will have them draw plaster casts, and they'll go through those processes before they even get to the point of drawing from a live model. It sounds like you went right into a live model. Is that right? We did. Yeah, we did at that time. And, uh, you know, the curriculum was kind of like shifted and morphed uh, throughout the years. And, and, and Barg, Barg started to become well known um, while I was studying. And then they kind of incorporated it. And I think that that makes sense, because if you think about it, you're taking you're taking two dimensions and you're trying to you know, translate it into two dimensions. Right. Whereas when you're working from a model, you're uh, you're trying to translate three dimensions into two dimensions. And so it's just one more layer uh, of difficulty. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, you know, all, all of these things I think are valid and helpful. Um, you know, so, but yeah, so with the, the structure when I started was we would do cast, cast work in the morning. It was, a, it was an eight hour day cut into two, four hour blocks and, um, five days a week for nine months out of the year. Uh, and so the first, um, the, you know, the first four hours was I was working on a cast drawing, which I'll show you again in a second here. And in the afternoons, we were working, uh, we were working from the figure. And then uh, every Wednesday, we would do a portrait sketch, quick, a quick portrait sketch, so that most of the other projects we were working on were were longer form. We were working on the same model, the same pose, uh, the same cast over many weeks. Um, and uh, and then so it was nice to kind of get into really uh, something where we had to adapt and, and work a little bit more quickly. Right. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think I think Barg is I think Barg is great. You learn, you kind of learn by osmosis how these guys were translating and, and understanding things, and uh, and and again, what you see in those Barg uh, those Barg plates is just a very clear, you know, separation of light and dark, particularly in the early ones. You know, the, yeah. the ones in the beginning of the book. Let me uh, uh, let me just for the people who are confused, yeah. there's a couple of comments that they don't know what a cast drawing is. Uh, this yeah. is not this is not Josh's, but I wanted to show you how how this was typically done. A plaster cast. That's what they mean with a cast drawing, and yeah. then it's set up, uh, you know, sight size identical next to it, and then you draw what you see, right? So that's just as an example. I I thought that you would be it. helpful to help people understand that. You got it. Yeah, I mean that's that's the idea, and so. You know what the advantage of a cast drawing. This is my this is my very first cast drawing uh, in school. Um, the advantage here is you're you're working from life, right? You're I've set up a single light source, just as you saw in the portrait. The light's coming in from above and to the right here, um, and it's and it's white, right? So it's a plaster cast as opposed to sort of being like a bronze sculpture or something like that. Um, so that you, you don't, you don't have any color information to deal with. You don't have anything other than just trying to draw accurately and understand value relationships. And then you, uh, we do these in graphite. Some people do them in charcoal, um, you know, whatever they, they all work. I think one of the advantages of the graphite is it's very forgiving medium in the sense that when you're, when you're drawing or sketching, it, depending on the paper and the, and the, the hardness of the pencil you're using, it's, it's more easily erased than say like a dark charcoal. Um, now that being said, you can't get as dark a value as you can with charcoal. Uh, but at any rate, so that's what you know. That's what this was about. I, I probably spent a month on this um, working in, working in the mornings. It doesn't mean that it has to take that long. I think the idea is to slow down and 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 try to see new things, right? And usually, if you're kind of just sort of like rushing through. Uh, you don't get to that layer, that level of, uh, you know, fidelity. And, and you're, you're, you're essentially trying to sort of make a switch with these and, and in rendering in general from seeing this, this, the surface of the page and actually peering back into the, into behind the picture plane into this three-dimensional space. And this would be, you know, an example of like a Trump Loy where it, the idea, if I do this successfully, it'll actually look like, the cast is hanging on the wall. Uh, 
But uh, anyway, you can you can also sort of see. Can you see do those doodles show up, Eric? Can not very, not very well, but you Let can me, maybe show them up close to the yeah. camera. Yeah. So here's right. here's uh, here's Jacob trying to sort of describe to me the sort of the direction of the light source using a sphere as sort of like a, a basic conceptual model. And you know, the very simple idea with with value is that a plane that's more perpendicular to the light source is brighter, right? It seems very very simple, and there's there's certainly layers of complexity on top of that. But what I'm trying to do here is just think about that. I'm, I'm trying to educate my eyes, right? My eyes are not impartial observers. They, they kind of make assumptions and my brain translates in a certain way. And so I need to educate what I'm seeing given the idea that, okay, here's, here's the direction of the light source. And so these planes like on the chin that are more perpendicular to the light source, those are the ones that are brighter. And as those planes tip away, they get darker. And then it's up to me to figure out how to handle the medium, the, the limitations of the values, the graphite and the light of the page will allow me to create that illusion of volume. It, one of the issues with this. It, it seems to me that, you know, from a student perspective, that that's one of the hardest things to do is to, you yeah. want to get, you want to get right on to all the fun stuff and to spend the amount of time required on that seems like a complete, waste of time but it's so <laughs> valuable yeah it's so valuable because once once you've done it and you've if you slow down and you take the time to do it it really makes a huge difference and and also it, it, when you're doing pieces like this with the chin and the mouth and the crevices of the mouth and so on when you start doing a uh, you know a mouth in real life now you're going to start realizing the structure issues that yeah. you have wrong yeah, I mean, you certainly you learn something about just the, the mouth itself by by you know zooming in. And this is this is David, right? The Michelangelo's David. There they they cut out you know basic features: his eyes, his two eyes, his nose, and his mouth. And those became would become sort of like the first the first ones to do. So you're you're connecting to sort of classical uh, uh, form at the, at the same time, right? Uh, as well as just sort of the the anatomy of it all. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, uh, so I have, I have some music background and, uh, I kind of, I often make this analogy where, you know, there's two ways to learn to play the guitar, right? Where you can, you know, you just go, you go buy one and you sort of learn chord shapes with, you know, with your hands and maybe pick up some tablature and, you know, you can, you can, before too long, you can be sort of strumming along with, you know, popular, popular songs you like, right? Um, but that's good. you're only going to get so far with that, right? That's going to have its its limit. To really learn the guitar, you're going to need to learn how to read music. You know, you need to uh, practice etudes so you can get real dexterity uh, in both hands. Um, you're going to practice slower and simpler songs in the beginning and progressively get harder, you know, and more difficult. Um, and it just seems to me to be a perfect sort of translation into into how to do uh, art. You know, if you really you know, wanting to give a go at it, there's the there's no shortcut, right? I mean, you need to sort of slow down and and uh, and sort of take it take it piece by piece. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you think, Eric? Does that seem accurate? Yeah, I like it. Good. Now you've got a cast drawing back up again. Thanks. Yeah. Well, so this is uh, this was my final cast drawing. So I, I had done probably maybe one or two in between the last one that I just showed you, uh, getting progressively harder. Um, and so I, I probably spent, you know, three or four months, uh, just on this one. And again, you know, it doesn't matter the time I'm just trying to give you a sense of, you know, how I was trying to zoom in here and just have, you know, uh, a real connection to the sculpture itself, uh, and, and see things. And what I, you know, hopefully what kind of translates over the, you know, the, the internet is I, I got better at. At value distribution. So the idea was, is I flattened the shadows, and the shadows got darker. So that what that does is it gave me a greater range that I could work with uh, on the paper. And then I figured out how to start, you know, uh, compressing my values. So these these planes that are right here um, next to next to the shadow, they they need to be extremely dark, but not completely merged with the shadow. And that's that's really a trick. So that then I'm conserving all of my light, my light values uh, for over here. Because these, again, the light source is coming in from this direction. And so these planes, which are more perpendicular to the light, need to be brighter, right? Um, and, you know, but again, so this is a single light source. Most of the ambience in the room has been blocked out. 
and that greatly uh, reduced my, you know, the variables that I had to deal with. And so it's just, it came down to how do I draw him accurately? The, you know, the two pillars of art making are accurate drawing and good value relationships. And that's what this was all, that's what this was all about, um, you know, and, and dealing with a more complex surface, right? So I had to figure out how to model a mouth, you know, not just abstractly as in the, the first cast drawing, it has to now be in context, right? So I had to, figure out how to keep the values uh you know in line and not pop all of the little individual lights and darks in here so that i could save the larger uh what you might call larger form form modeling um but yeah so that was so that was maybe the first year uh, of my uh, of my studies uh, all the while doing basically the same thing but in the figure room so we would do a block in and then take that through a fully, you know, attempting to do a fully rendered uh, uh, from the new model, uh, one one a month essentially, and uh, and so you just you know you develop a method, a quick method, uh, again and again and again. Well, All right. So, where, where where do people find plaster casts like that? If if they is there a source that you recommend? Yeah, good uh, good question. Uh, I think you can probably get like the smaller features, like the ones I was showing you, you know, at a local art store. They usually, my, I've seen them in most art stores that I've looked in. Uh, but there's a great there's a great uh, place online called Juist. I believe it's G U I S T. Um, I, you know, I'm sure if you Google it, uh, it might be G I. Yeah, I think it's G U I S T. Uh, but they, you can order them online, and you can get you can get busts, you can get full figures. Uh, you know, there's kind of no, uh, no limit there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they make what do you think, Eric? Any other questions about cast drawing? Oh, kind of... I don't think so. They make great yeah. decorations for your studio too. I they had do. Uh, I mean, one, one thing that I, I, I of course have never gone through a formal training process to this extent. And so I have a cast that I keep set up in my, um, in my studio. And I have a, a light that I keep set up on it. And, and I will once in a while continue to work on that. You know, I, I just keep it set up. So when I have some time, I work on it because it, it's so valuable. And uh, of course, I don't have anybody telling me uh, what's wrong with it. I can't see it myself until I, until I get away from it for a few days. And then when I do, I can see usually what the mistakes were. Okay, what do we, what do we have here? Yeah, well, so, okay, so after cast growing, we moved on to cast painting. Uh, so now you're, you know, you're building on with one layer of difficulty greater, right? So now you have to use paint in order to try to, to try to create this illusion. And uh, you're dealing now with when it was drawing and you were on a white sheet, you were, you were only laying down dark value, right? And so then when you get to cast painting, not only are you dealing with the oil medium itself, oil paints, um, you're having to actually lay down your light and, and lay down your dark. And so you're choosing, you're choosing your two values. Now, so this is the preparatory drawing uh, for my last cast drawing that I did. I had done probably like two or three before this, um, you know, spending, you know, equal amounts of time. Uh, so, so this is like, would have been my second year of study uh, or somewhere thereabouts. Um, and so I just, you know, it's a very linear, um, a, a very linear drawing. What I'm, 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 trying to be very clear about it so that I can use this to transfer it to, to my canvas. Uh, but again, you know, I, I just want to hit this home that especially while you're learning, um, I can't recommend enough to uh, set up, to spend time with your setup uh, and, and get it done properly. Control the lighting, you know, so you can just very, you can see these very clear shapes of light and dark. Um, uh, you know, even even up in the hair, there's individual little cast shadows and things like that. Um, you might be able to see some of the little doodles again here of Jacob kind of trying to describe to me the the rhythms and the gesture uh, of the pose. Because not only am I, you know, trying to draw the shapes accurately, I'm trying to, you know, get something of the way that that the the piece flows together. Um, so what are your thoughts on uh, this? This here is planes of the head. Right? Yeah. And so it's a training tool. So you can see where the light is hitting the different planes and so on. Uh, what are your thoughts on using a tool like this? Well, I don't I mean, I think anytime you're drawing something, you know, and if you put that under a single light source, uh, you know, you, you can see you can see even just in the uh, how you're showing it to us now, you've got 
you've got light coming in from all the different windows around you, right? Right, right. And so you have no you have no shadow shapes at all. But if you were to put that under a single light source, block out the ambience, I mean, you you would have a, a fine uh, you know a fine thing to work from to it's get a good training tool. Yeah, okay. Drawing branches from yeah. So now I'm going to show you um, I'm going to show you the cast painting that uh, that resulted from this. Um, Oh. Can, is that showing up on the shot? Here's yeah. too hot. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, again, this 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 took me quite quite a while. I had you know I had done several before this where you know the, the I wasn't able to kind of control the lights and keep keep the lights uh, as bright and compressed as this, um, so that it actually looks like a white cast. Some of the other some of the first ones I did they looked kind of gray and, and sort of. Uh, uh, well, just dull, really. But uh, anyway, so the lights coming in from above into the left to kind of switch that, switch that side. And this is this is kind of like what I might call a half light, right? So, sort maybe three quarters, where it's sort of three quarters of it is in light and one quarter, you know, one third of it or whatever is is in shadow. And that's generally easier than what you might call front light. Like what how I'm lit right now, how my face is lit. Uh, is what you might call front light in the sense that the light's coming in from right over the top uh, of my head. And so there's not as many shadows. And that's fine. I think there's, you know, that's an okay setup. But if you do this, you've got a much clearer gradation from dark to light, right? And so I can, yeah. I've, got a, I've got a very clear shadow shape. That's all flat. And then I've got just this really, you know, simple gradation from dark to light. Um, and uh, it just makes it that much easier uh, to just deal with the, the, the problem at hand right? yeah. rather than yeah. having to do all, you know, all those other things. Yeah. Light in that leg, for instance. There's, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I said there's a beautiful reflected light in that shadow area as well, which right. is a great, a great training tool to see. Absolutely, yeah. And so what was the question? Oh, I just said outstanding. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, I was, you know, I, was, I had obviously learned quite a bit at this point. I, I'd, I had been able to kind of, you know, peer into the, the picture plane and create this, create this, uh, this volume, this space. Um, but I hadn't dealt with color up to this point. And, um, you know, so, so that, that's kind of, that's kind of the next step uh, beyond that. Um, but at any rate, you know, I, I just hope that that's starting to sink in, even if you're working from reference photographs, if, even if you're, you know, taking, uh, you're not working from casts and you're going to go straight to working from, uh, you know, models or, you know, your children or whatever. Just think about trying to, you know, set that, set them up a little bit differently in a way that will make it a little bit easier for you. Um, I do have some other things to, to show you. How are we doing on Tyner? Uh, we're okay. We've got, um, well, we got about 15 minutes, I'd say. All right. Um, I mentioned that uh, I mentioned that we would do these these uh, quick uh, portrait sketches once a week. Every Wednesday afternoon, we would do about a four or five hour portrait sketch, um, and this was my my sort of opportunity to uh, to work with full full color paint, even in my first and second year when I when I was when I was doing my cast work, and um, it was really just a fun you know uh, an instructive uh, time you know because again I'm working from life. I'm trying to translate, you know, the uh, the things I'm learning about value relationships and seeing shadows and drawing accurately, uh, and do it in this really compressed time. Um, so I've, I, you know, I've got you know hundreds of these, and and I and I sold some of them. There was a there was a um, the art student showcase in New York City at the time where we could all kind of take our little studies down to and sell them and make you know fifty, hundred bucks and buy some more art materials and keep going, but. Um, but anyway, this this was really really helpful. I mean, I think this is probably you know um, something more like what people are used to with like Alla Prima um, and, and work. But again, you know, working from a live model, we took the time to uh, uh, you know get the, the clear setup so you can you can see these these really clear shadow shapes, right? The cast yeah, shadow. When, shadow. when you uh, use a term like Alla Prima, uh, if you'll explain it to people because some people won't know what a term like that means. Sure. Yeah. So. All of Prima is uh, basically painting wet into wet. Uh, you're you're going uh, directly onto the canvas, usually without any kind of preliminary drawing. You know, all these things, all these terms are, are somewhat, you know, 
uh, debatable. But uh, the point is, is you're just using opaque paint to get the full effect immediately, as opposed to um, painting in layers, uh, which is what I tend to do. So that you know, I'm building up paint uh, in subsequent sessions, allowing allowing one layer to dry, and then working working back over the top of it. Um, so uh, does that make sense? Yep. All right. So anyway, so th th this was really really fun. It was really hard, um, you know, to go from doing these long form uh, cast drawing and figure drawings to then trying to do this in uh, you know four or five hours. Um, but you know, I, I learned a lot about just sort of controlling paint, making a lot of mistakes, and and I think that that's useful too. I think you know one mistake you can you can make when learning is if things get a little too precious to you, uh, you know, you you really do need to, do need to be able to just sort of throw a, a canvas aside if if your anxiety is building up. Um, and uh, anyway, so just a word of word of caution, I guess. Um, okay. So moving on, you know, I wanted to just sort of then show you a little bit. These may, be, may, may not be quite as interesting to look at, but these, these were these were my block end studies. So I also just took a time to work from the cast, and I was just trying to see shapes, you know. So we would I would just do one a day and just again and again try to, you know, we would set the casts uh, on their sides, and uh, we we called them tippy casts. So that it, the idea was to just sort of again abstract these shapes and forget that I was drawing a foot. I was just I was just measuring, uh, doing comparative measurement and trying to sort of see shapes and fit these things interlocking in a puzzle. And I can't. This was probably uh, the part of my studies where I felt like things clicked the most. Um, hmm. And uh, I was just I, I I finally sort of understood you know how to observe more more clearly and just be very ruthless about uh, how, how to fit things, how to fit things together. And when you can do that in a portrait, when, you know, you're dealing with something really meaningful, psychologically meaningful to us, like an eye um, or like your corners of the mouths and things like that, that have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, meaning and, and importance when it comes to an expression, then uh, if you can abstract it, you're much more likely to sort of see what's actually there. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. yeah. So I just did this again and again and again. Some of them were kind of two days. They're not like highly resolved. Um, you know, we uh, of course I enjoyed the, the we had a good cast collection. But with each of these, you know, I hope you can kind of see just the 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 light and dark. You know, so again, it's just the the setup. The setup was already there. There was no amb ambient light. You know, so here's a. Here's a cast that unfortunately she had lost. Um, she was attached to a body at one point and uh, <laughs> got knocked over. And so anyway, you know, I set her, set her uh, um, upside down. And, but you can just, you can just sort of see how I'm, I'm trying to grapple with that, that, that light and dark. And you can kind of make out, you know, that it's that it is a portrait. Um, but, uh, but anyway. Well, and you, it, it also is is really teaching you drawing from so many different perspectives. Right. You know, we, we tend to want to draw things straight on or, you know, put the three quarter head instead of, right. you know, there are going to be times when you're going to want to do some kind of a painting where you have somebody's head laying on the ground, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> true. John, John the Baptist or something. <laughs> it's true. So anyway, I hope, I, you know, what I was trying to get across with these was just, um, you know, how much time and intention it took to really uh, sort of gain these, gain some of these, uh, these skills. Uh, and then eventually sort of after cast, uh, cast drawing in Grisaille, I would do the figure in Grisaille. So now I'm painting a live model in front, but to only in black and white, and then moved on fully, uh, fully into color. Um, and so that was kind of, I don't have any examples of that uh, right here for it, for you guys to see. Uh, I have some other stuff to show you, but, um, uh, the point was, is again, just, you know, one, one layer at a time, really having spent a lot of time trying to learn how to draw accurately and, um, and understand value relationships. And those are the, those are the main pillars. Um, so uh, here I'm going to kind of just show you some of the studies I had for my own work once I, uh, you know, once I got out on my own and now I was trying to take these skills and how do I, how do I make something <clears throat> meaningful, right? And then how do I, and and also something that that finds a home in the marketplace. Um, 
this was a so this was a figure study that I did that, that ended up uh, turning into a painting. Um, you did this from a live model. I did. I did. Yeah, I worked for uh, a great model. I don't know if you um, you ever met him, but having been around, his name was John Forkner. He just was super excited about it. He was an actor uh, in New York, and um, but he just he really loved it, and he would he would really uh, uh, you know. Uh, he was willing to do difficult things like this. I mean, you can imagine holding his arm up like that. We, you know, he could only do it at certain certain times, and so I would, you know, we would do it for like five minutes, and and uh, and then he'd take his arm back down and then try to work on his torso or his head or something like that. Um, but even even just the angle of the head uh, was was pretty difficult. Um, but I was trying to do these faster, right? So you know, the luxury that we that I enjoyed in the studio where we were working on these for you know. 40, 80 hour long drawings. Um, now I had to figure out how to, how to make this economical and uh, you know, model fees, model fees add up. So, so what I did is I, I was working on a tone paper uh, and white chalk. And so it was just kind of like a faster way to get the basic, you know, preparatory drawing um, down on the page uh, pretty quickly. And um, you know, so, so maybe I spent one or two sessions on this three hours each or something like that. Um, and then I blew it up and I transferred it, transferred it to the canvas, added some drapery here, drapery down there and put them in, put them in kind of a landscape. Um, but now at this point I had been, uh, I found a studio, um, I found a studio in New York that had a really large, uh, skylight. And so the aperture of the light was much wider than what I had been showing you previously. Uh, you know, we were from, we were from in the, in the studio. Um, in the atelier. And so you can see that the shadow shapes are a little less distinct, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're there, maybe they're clearer on the drawing um, and they're, you know, you can see some of the cast shadow on the neck, but, but there's just so much more ambient light and that can be nice, you know, so it, it, it certainly can be done, but, I, but this would have been, you know, far more difficult uh, to learn from just because then, then I would be dealing, you know, with the, you know, a much more subtle light source with more ambience and it's variable throughout the day, you know, as there's clouds right, right. Um, and throughout the year. So, right. you know, again, all these things can be done, but I would recommend just, you know, get, do yourself a favor when you're learning, try to control it as much as you possibly can. Um, so yeah. there's that one. Um, I had another one here that turned into, uh, turned into a, uh, a larger painting. This, these were, Maybe you can these put that up. Or just, or maybe you can show it closer yep. to the camera. Yep. So these are just a couple sort of figure studies that had the model in, and I was trying to figure out what pose I was going to uh, eventually uh, eventually go with. You right. know, so we would maybe take one or two times to just kind of like work out a position, think about structure, think about think about the idea. I ended up I ended up going with this one, and then did a. Wow. more thorough preparatory drawing. Again, this is on the tone page with uh, with white chalk for the highlights and then just a little bit, you know, of the graphite to try to start to work out the modeling. Um, but just basically the, the the bones that I would need to transfer this uh, to the larger canvas. And I was kind of trying to work out um, maybe a different, a different hand position uh, over here out to the side. Uh, and then after that, I, I love Bouguereau. I mean, I think that, that um, that's something that I'm, I tend to be sort of known for, the 19th century French academic painter. And he, uh, he would do a lot of these sort of hand and feet studies. And I was trying to figure out why. I was just sort of, you know, what was, what was the advantage to it? And so uh, with this, th these are the hands and feet from the, from the drawing that I just showed you. Uh, my idea was if I, if I can, you know, get these, these things down, and I can do it quickly, then maybe I can actually paint the final painting from, from these studies and save myself a little bit of time and a little bit of cost as far as model fees go. Um, but also it's just, you know, it's a good exercise to sort of work out things that maybe, uh, maybe I didn't see in the drawing phase. Yeah, that's uh, fabulous. But that was fun. You know, so it was just a scrap piece of canvas. I transferred the drawing onto there and then, uh, and then tried to sort of, this is sort of more, more a la prima, right? So it's a little bit, I don't know, it probably doesn't come through, but you, it's sort of a thinner, thinner paint. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, uh, yeah. Throw it in the frame. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it should. So, um, yeah. So then the last thing that I've got here to show you is uh, I've got, I had like 
I had this on the easel when we first started. This is a self-portrait uh, that I did several years ago. Uh, again, in a different studio with a, um, uh, a skylight. It was a smaller aperture skylight. So now I'm kind of back to having, meaning just the, meaning the, the window was smaller, right? So there was, right. there was less ambience. Um, and so I had these clearer shadow shapes sort of in my face. Uh, but I went through the same, the same general process where you know I started with a, uh, a preparatory drawing to try to work out uh, the pose um, and get something that I was happy with and you know, try to think about the gestures that I was working working with in the hands. Um, I had a mirror behind me uh, on the wall, so I was painting this from life, um, you know, looking into the mirror and sort of turning around and doing the painting uh, because the lights coming in and, and hitting the, hitting the canvas that I was painting from, and I was painting the canvas looking at the mirror. Uh, so it was a fun challenge. Yeah, but, um, well, it's great memory training. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, that's fabulous, Josh. This has been very helpful. I, I think you know, based on the comments, everybody's loved this. You, uh, you, you know, you don't always get an artist talking about their process and their paintings and the learning process. And I think a lot of people are getting a lot out of this today. This has been terrific. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I hope it was helpful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have any idea what you're going to do in Realism Live? Well, I have an idea to do. Uh, I want to take take advantage of the format that we're you know that we're not going to be uh, sort of indoors in a conference room. I'm thinking about doing uh, an outdoor portrait sketch of my wife. Uh, see if oh. I can talk her into sitting for me, and um, uh, and and we'll talk about hopefully some of these things you know uh, that we've been discussing. Um, and uh, but that'll probably be more of like an ala prima sketch. But again, you know, the principles will be there. We'll talk about light. We'll talk about, you know, the you know, graphic sh you know, shape of light and dark and, and how to think about. Uh, well, painting it. outdoors has its own set of challenges because, you know, the light source is moving and changing and the leaves are getting in the way or the clouds are getting in the way. So that 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 will be very fun to watch. 